heard an amen in there. See, I told you. I told you. Um, and so they were very exciting, but because they were exotic, that's my point, okay? Usually, so usually when we think about missions, we think about something that's exotic. Um, tribal lands, faraway places. We even use words like unreached people, things like that, that that's what missions is about. And surely it is, because there are many places in the world where people do not know about Christ and who need to know about him. And our mission is to tell them, let them know, do all we can to make sure that they know about him. But things have changed so much here in the United States over the last, well, let's say since World War II, okay? Things have changed so much that it is a truism now to say that the United States of America, North America, is the mission field too. And that's not so exotic, but it is certainly real and true. And so if you're thinking that today you can hear about missions in Congo or Uganda or China or Vietnam and think to yourself, whew, I'm glad we're going to get, I can't wait till we get past all that because that has nothing to do with me. If that's why you came and that's what you were expecting, I'm sorry. Um, the truth is, is that you now live in one of the most pagan countries in the world. Yeah, even in North Carolina. You live in one of the most pagan countries in the world. And you may assume that everybody, because of billboards, because of churches all over the place, that everyone in the United States had, understands about Jesus, and they've heard this thing that we call the gospel and things like that. You may believe that's true, because looking in this church, you're about the age where that might have been close to true when you were growing up. But it's not true anymore. Did you know that? You can, this is Saturday morning, not Sunday morning, so you can move. <laughs> you can nod your head and all kinds of things, okay? It is just not true that people know who Jesus is and that people in your neighborhood understand the most basic and fundamental things about Christianity. They do not. And so this idea of having a missions conference is no longer about the exotic alone, it's now about you and me. And it's no longer about people who get on a bus and then get on an airplane and go somewhere far away and we'll send them money. It's about us and our lives, our daily lives. Are you with me on this? It's you at work, it's you in your neighborhood, it's you at the Walmart, it's you at the concert, it's you every single day. Uh, Christ has called us to be on mission. And so it's good to take time like this on a Saturday to ask the question, what would it mean for me, me, you, to be on mission? And by God's mercy, maybe we can actually be inspired to take it up and get busy with it. How about that? Now, the passage that we're going to look at this morning is familiar, I hope, to most of us. It's, um, although I find in some Christian churches it no longer is, it's what we often call the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. I think it's in your program, isn't it? Did I pick the right message? Good, thank you. If not, we just reverse it. We'll just do it on Sunday morning. But yeah, the, so we're going to do the Lord's Prayer, but I suspect that most of us know that passage. So rather than me read it to you, I'm going to ask you to recite it with me, not as a prayer, but as our scripture reading for the message this morning. But before we do, I have to ask you, in this church, do you have trespassers or debtors? I didn't have, no. which is it? Debtors? Okay. So if you're a trespasser this morning, you're off the hook, okay? But if you're a debtor, pay some attention to what we're about to say. Do you remember that Jesus' disciples asked him to teach them how to pray? And he said, pray this way. Now recite it with me, please. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now let's pray. Lord Jesus, we have heard these words. 
we've recited these words that you taught your disciples to pray long ago, thousands of years ago. And we're asking now that you will send Holy Spirit to us and that he will enable us on this early Saturday morning to give our hearts and give our minds, give our lives to what you taught your disciples thousands of years ago. We pray for this because, Lord, we know that these words are well known to us and they can become stale and they can become meaningless. And we know, Lord, that even when we talk about mission, it can seem something like something very far away to us. But we're asking now that Holy Spirit will open our eyes, that he'll soften our hearts, that the power he used to resurrect you from the dead will be given to us so that we might walk in newness of life. And as you do that, we will give you the praise and the honor for it. Amen. You know, you can tell a lot about yourself by what you pray about. Did you realize that? And so when you go to bed at night and you've forgotten to pray all day and you realize, oh no, I forgot to pray today, and you put your head on your pillow, what do you pray about? If you're normal, I don't know if these people, you people are normal or not, but if you're normal, it's going to be something like, Lord, please bless my children. Lord, please bless my grandchildren. You're gone. Okay, it's a great sleeping pill, this idea of praying while you're on the bed. Okay, it's, you go right away. And, but you understand what I mean when I say that. You pray about things that are important to you when you end up praying. Is that not fair enough? And so when Jesus is asked, Lord, teach us how to pray, he's, teach, he's saying all kinds of things in this prayer. It's jam-packed with all kinds of things that we could elaborate on. But let's just boil it down to this. It's what was important to him. And it's what he wanted to be important to his disciples who were asking that question, what should we pray for? And what we find in the Lord's Prayer is things that should be important, not just to disciples living thousands of years ago, but to disciples living today. That's you and me. These should be at the top of the list. The kinds of things that when you pray, if you get around to it, um, you pray about those things because they're really dear, near to your heart. The kind of thing that preoccupies you, that you want to think about. And I think that most of us in this room today could admit that we can find the centerpiece of our Christian walk somewhere in the Lord's Prayer. You can find it. It's there. And, but let's just admit it, that most of us would tend to think, well, what I pray for is in there, but most of us will gravitate toward what's at the bottom of the Lord's Prayer, at the, in the last half of the Lord's Prayer. You know how it goes. Give us this day our daily bread. Which means basically, Lord, please take care of me. I need you to take care of my daily needs, please. Can I have a job? Can things go well at work? Please take care of my finances. Those kinds of things. Give us this day our daily bread. What's next? Come on, it's Saturday morning. You can do it. I know it's going to be hard in this room to speak up, but we're going to do it this morning. Give us this day our daily bread. What's next? Forgive us our debts. Yeah. Oh, boy. So that's important to us, too. Lord, I did it again. Can you forgive me? Forgive us our debts. And the last one is, lead us not into temptation. That's right. Or, and protect us from the evil one. And that's a big one, too, for us. If you have any sense of who you are and what's going on in your life, you know that in one way or another, it feels like temptation coming from the evil one is very powerful and very threatening. And so, yeah, we can find ourselves in the bottom half of the Lord's Prayer. But one of the things that I often ask myself and I think it's true, is why did Jesus put those things in the prayer and why did he put it in the bottom half of the prayer? Why should we be praying for food to eat, a job to work, bills to pay? Why should we, why should we be concerned about such things? Why should we be concerned about finding forgiveness for our sins? What's the, what's the point? Why should we pray for help against all the temptations that surround us? What's the point? What's the purpose? What's the goal? And I think that many of us would probably say, well, isn't that obvious? 
I need to eat. Isn't it obvious? I keep messing up. Isn't it obvious? The temptations that we live with today are so enormous that if we don't get some help, we're going to fall. And so it should be obvious, Richard, what's wrong with you? But let me, let me just say this. I think there's something more important than that, more, something more important than your well-being. Oops, I know that's going to be a hard thing to believe. Something more important than my well-being, <laughs> my children's well-being, my family. Uh, yeah, something more important that sort of sets the stage for why those things should be a part of the list of what's important to us, the things we pray about. Okay, so where do we find the answer to why? Why should we pray for those things? Well, um, the answer is the first half of the Lord's Prayer. You know, it's the part of the prayer that you sort of mumble through till you get to something that means something to you. Give us this day our daily bread. The top half. And you know how it goes. Our Father, who art in heaven, how would be your name? I mean, how could that possibly be something important to you when you don't even know what the word hallowed means? You with me? Okay. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay. Now let's get to something that means something to me. Give us this day our daily bread. But the question of why should we pray for daily bread and the other things that are in the bottom half is answered by that first half. So maybe what we need to do is to focus our attention on it just a little bit and see if it can be more than just an intro. Something that's a little more significant to us than just, well, I need to get through this part because that's being polite to God and I'll get down to what I really want later on. So what I'm hoping we'll do this morning is just look briefly, we don't have much time, but at the same time draw our attention to how significant that first half of the Lord's Prayer is and what it can mean for your life and what it has to do with the mission, the mission that Jesus has called you to be a part of, not just in exotic places, but right here. So let's start off with what Jesus says about God, because it's pretty obvious, isn't it, that the first line or two is about God? Can everybody admit that that's true? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let's just start there for just a moment. A lot of times when people hear those words, Father, our Father, it's, those are precious words to Christians, but sometimes we bring in some ideas related to Father that don't quite work with what Jesus meant. So let me see if we can't just get past that real fast here. When we hear the word Father, I don't know how this happens to us, but I don't know if we get it from movies, from TV, from children's books, whatever it may be. We, we hear our Father, and we think of God like he's a sweet old granddaddy sitting up in heaven, rocking in his rocking chair like this, and, of course, looking down on the earth and wringing his hands in frustration and saying to himself, oh, I just wish my children on the earth would pay more attention to me because if they call out to me, I'd give them all kinds of things because I exist to make them happy. I exist to have them love me. This is just so important to me because I'm their father. And every man in here who's a grandfather knows exactly what that means. We live for our grandchildren to like us. Fair enough. I've got three grandchildren. When they were really little, every time they wanted anything, I got it for them. I can't do that anymore because it's, they're older, and now it's things like, can I have a car? And the answer is, no, <laughs> you can't have a car. And if they wanted one of those toys, you know, go to Toys R Us or something, one of those toys, I'd get two. Three's better. Let's get the big one. I mean, the really big one because I was trying to condition them into loving me. There was nothing more important for me than for me to walk in the room and for them to, be, to begin to salivate like Pavlov's dogs. Pops is here. You with me? This is going to be a great day. Pops is here. Well, I have some good news for you. That's not what Jesus meant, even though a lot of Christians feel this way and think this way. It's not what Jesus meant when he said, our Father. And you get the first clue that this is true because he doesn't just say pray our Father. He says pray our Father in heaven. 
our Father in heaven. Okay, so now think about the Bible for a minute and ask this question. When the Bible talks about heaven, and there are four or five, six places where it actually talks about heaven, Old Testament and New Testament, what's the picture? It's not God's living room where he sits on a rocking chair. I can tell you that. Uh, Heaven is described in the Bible as the throne room of God. It's where God sits on a throne and blinding light radiates from him. Myriads upon myriads of creatures are ministering to him, serving him, bowing down before him. There are these creatures, bizarre creatures, but nevertheless creatures in heaven who are constantly crying out, holy, holy, holy. You know that passage, Isaiah chapter 6? Hallowed be thy name. You see, that's what Jesus is talking about. May your name be kept holy. So when Jesus is talking this way, he's directing his apostles and disciples' attention to the fact that God is in heaven sitting on his throne and may his name be kept holy like those creatures up there are crying out day and night. In other words, may he be honored, may he be respected, may he be acknowledged as the one who's above everything, the one who's pure, the one who is wondrous, the holy one, the one who sits on the throne. To put it bluntly, Jesus is saying this, God is your king. Now, you may be shocked to know this, but in the days of the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, and In Israel and outside of Israel, it was very common for people to call their kings their father. So this is what Jesus is telling us to think about. Number one, when it comes to praying, our royal father enthroned in heaven, may you be honored. That's a terribly hard thing to do for you and me. Because when we, when we think of kingship, we don't know what to think about. Because no one in this room that grew up in this country has ever lived under the authority of a king. We've never lived under the authority of somebody who holds our lives and our deaths in their hands. Never. In fact, I come from Virginia, as I said before, and like you, we don't like the idea of a king, a human king ruling over us. Does anybody know what the Virginia state flag looks like? What the Virginia seal looks like? It's beautiful. It's much better than your flag. (laughs) That's for sure. Okay, that is for sure. So let me describe it to you. And if you want to Google it on your phone right now to verify, it's perfectly fine with me. It won't bother me at all. Um, It's a picture Um, the flag is this nice blue satin background and the middle of the flag is a circle. And a lot of people know that much. If you drive through Virginia, you'll see that much of it. But I need to tell you what's inside the circle. It's a picture. It's a picture of a man lying dead on his back on the ground with a crown that's fallen off of his head next to him. He's a dead king. And standing over this dead king is a woman with a spear in her hand and her foot on the chest of this dead king. You got the picture? This is what Virginians believe about kings. (laughs) And written under that, or sometimes over that picture of the woman standing over the dead king, are these words in Latin, sic semper tyrannis, thus always to tyrants. So if you didn't know it, the message is that we will not have a king rule over us in the state of Virginia. And if someone tries to become our king, we know exactly what to do. We will send our women after them and they will take care of it. (laughs) Isn't that the message? I almost heard an amen from somebody. Um, So here we are living in a country that refuses to have a human king ruling over us, just refuses. We're just not going to have that. I don't know how to tell you this, but it's so true that when you have a country that is governed of the people, by the people, for the people, it isn't long before you have religion that's of the people, by the people, and for the people. Because you don't have anything to compare it to. You don't have any earthly experience 
to learn what it would mean to say that God is your king. But the number one way that the Bible describes God to us, and there are all kinds of ways, but the number one way, the most unifying way that the Bible describes and the most prominent way that he is described is that he is our emperor. And of course, what this means is, is that he owns us, lock, stock, and barrel. Are you ready for that? You know, the reason why we don't like human kings, it's really obvious why we don't like them, is because human kings get uppity, and they think they're all that. They think they're better than you and me. And so they figure things like, you know, you ought to be happy to fulfill their purposes because their purposes are obviously better than yours and more important than yours. You ought to be willing to serve them because their kingdom and their glory is much more valuable than your glory. You ought to sacrifice for them and be happy to do it. You ought to be willing to die for them and be happy to die for them because, after all, they're kings. No wonder we don't want people ruling over us who are kings. But that is exactly, exactly what Jesus is saying is true for you and your God, that he is the king who is worthy of that kind of honor. He's a king who, yes, demands that his citizens or his servants are willing to live for him, sacrifice for him, die for him with joy. I don't know about you, but when I hear that, even though I have said that to maybe a million people in my lifetime, it still challenges me right down at the heart of who I am because I'm taught to live for me. And when I'm really spiritually minded, I live for my family too. <laughs> right? And yes, I'm willing to sacrifice for them, but this Jesus thing, I don't think so. Of the people, by the people, for the people. Is that your religion? This was at the top of the list for what Jesus wanted his disciples to pray for. It was at the top of the list of what he thought ought to preoccupy them every day. It was at the top of the list of all the things that he thought were significant for his followers in every generation. And brothers and sisters, if you can't see that even the body of Christ is compromised on this, and if you can't see that our culture and our friends and yes, even our families need somebody to stand up and say, he is our king, then I don't know what world you live in. We kind of get at this as good Presbyterians. If you didn't know, our catechism tells us that the chief end and goal for human existence is, number one, to glorify God, okay? We kind of know that, and we'll say that. We'll say glory to God, and oh, give God all the glory. Gloria a Dios, okay? We'll say those kinds of things, right? Okay, but basically that doesn't mean a whole lot to us. It's just a phrase. What it means is we are to live to see the name of God exalted, we are to live and die to see our king honored and praised. And that is the beginning of grasping what it means to be a Christian on mission. Okay, so Jesus starts off saying, at the top of the list, everything I'm going to pray for Everything I'm going to pray for, Lord, is so that you can receive honor as the great king of the universe. There. But then he goes on and says something else, and that is, what does this great king, this emperor of ours, what does he want? What's his goal? What's his plan? And it tells us right away. You know how it goes. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Well, how is that supposed to happen? Next. Thy kingdom come. You see, I told you he's thinking of God as king. He says, our father. And then the next thing he says is, may your kingdom come. You got it? I'm not making this up. 
He is your royal father, and he has a kingdom, and he wants that kingdom to come. Now, there's another wonderful religious phrase that used to be used a lot. I don't think we use it all that much anymore, but my grandmother used it all the time. When the kingdom comes, Mama, I can still remember you. When the kingdom comes, here's what would happen. We'd have Thanksgiving meal or, some, or Christmas meal with her, and all the grandchildren, of course, you'd get the pumpkin pie and the ice cream at the end, right? Okay, so what do the grandchildren do? Well, while she's washing the dishes for the next week and a half, you walk in and you interrupt her washing the dishes, and you say, Mama, can we have some more pie? Or Mama, can we have some more ice cream? And she would turn around without even drying her hands. She'd just turn around and say, sure, when the kingdom comes. <laughs> so I learned probably around three or four years old that the coming of God's kingdom meant no, <laughs> never, maybe one day, somehow, some way, but it don't bother me now because it doesn't have anything to do with my life or your life. You're not getting any more ice cream. It's just, just forget it, Okay. So it's, we, don't use, we don't even use the phrase anymore that often. Maybe some of us do at time, from time to time. But it's one, of, it's one of those religious phrases we know is a good thing to say, but we don't know what it means. We, don't have, we can't put feet on it. So let's see if Jesus did. May your kingdom come. And then he goes on and says, may your will be done. Now, that makes some sense to me right away, because what kind of king would he be if his will was not being done? Okay, impotent, not very effective, not very powerful. So, okay, I got that. I understand that, Jesus, that you want the kingdom to come, and that means you want God's will to be done. But, Jesus, where do you want God's will to be done? on earth as it is in heaven. Be careful now. Jesus is about to turn your religion upside down. He just did it. I don't know what your experience was like when you came to Christ for the first time. Maybe you can't even put your finger on the day when you realized, I'm now going to follow Jesus. But at some point along the way, somebody convinced you of something. And it was basically this. In all likelihood, this is what you heard in one way or another. You heard something like, if you will trust in Jesus, you'll be forgiven of your sins, and when you die, you'll go to heaven. And boys and girls, there's nothing more important in life than to make sure you go to heaven. And so going to heaven becomes, as it were, the, the ultimate dream for the Christian. Yep, I can only imagine going to heaven. In fact, I would say that most Christians, even in our kinds of churches, they think about the purpose of their faith, the, the goal that they have in mind, and it's something like this. They, they know, we all know we're going to die at some point or another, but we know that if we love Christ, we will be lifted up to heaven and we'll get to the gate and Peter will be there, presumably. I don't know. He's got the keys, I suppose. Okay. And he'll say, well, you have the blood of Jesus on you, so come on in. So we'll walk in. This will be great. This will be fantastic. But then he'll pause and say, wait just a minute. And he'll go to the closet, and he'll pull out of that closet a gigantic golden harp. Huge thing. And he'll hand it to you, and he'll say, now, this is your place in the choir right over there. And what I want you to do is start singing and start playing that harp forever and forever and forever and forever, have you ever heard anybody tell you, I know they do, that heaven is going to be like one wonderful eternal church service? Does that sound wonderful to you? I mean, I can put up, I could do it. I could do it for 10,000 years. Like Amazing Grace says, you know, 10,000 years. I could do it 10,000 years, but forever is a lot longer than that. And please, Lord, let there be somebody other than a Presbyterian up there running the worship service because that sounds more to me like the other side rather than heaven. I mean, can you sense that? 
that surely there's something bigger than that going on here. Surely I wasn't made to have a church service forever. And I'm happy to tell you that that's true. Because while we orient our Christian lives and our spiritual lives and our endeavors, and with, with truth and honesty and piety, it's nothing evil about this. We orient ourselves to trying to make sure that somehow, maybe by the skin of our teeth, we can get into the heavenly court because it is a lot better than going the other place. Surely it is. But somehow or another, we will think that's bliss. As if we're, I don't know, overdosed on some celestial drug or something, think that this will be just a wonderful thing to do forever. Well, the good news is, is that Jesus has turned that all upside down in his prayer. Because he says first that God is the king. Remember that. He's not your sugar daddy. He's your king. And that his purpose is to have a kingdom where his will is done. And where is that kingdom to occur? Can you tell me? On earth. Not heaven, on earth. Here's a little Bible quiz for you. What does the Bible talk about more, heaven or earth? Earth. A little bit more or a lot more? A lot more, immeasurably more. And that should let you know something. And that is that the faith of Christ is not oriented primarily for you squeezing your way into the courts of heaven. The faith that Jesus proclaimed and all the prophets before him and after him is that God is the king and he is determined to do something on this planet. And what is that? To build his kingdom here. Heaven is not the goal. Heaven is the standard for what's to happen here. And that's the goal. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it's already being done in heaven. Does that make sense to you? Heaven is the standard. So now, Bible again, how is God's will performed in that court of heaven? That's a, that's a good question, isn't it? Since that's the standard for what we're supposed to be praying for and working for and desiring to see happen on this planet. Well, when you read the Bible, you discover that everybody in that throne room, bowing before the blinding radiance of the glory of God, does exactly what the king on the throne says to do. Even the devil does not disobey God in the throne room of heaven. He says, yes, sir. Now, when he leaves there, he's just like you and me. He does what he wants to do. But when he's there, he doesn't even dream of such a thing. I don't know what happens to you if you disobey in the court of heaven. Maybe you melt. I don't know. I don't know. It won't be pleasant, though. I can guarantee that. So you don't even think about that. You wouldn't either. I wouldn't either. If we're before the blinding radiance of the holiness of God, the glory of God, we wouldn't, it would be... We'd be so overwhelmed, we wouldn't even think about doing something that would defy him. Why would you want to do that? Well, the will of God is done universally in that courtroom among those myriads upon myriads upon myriads of creatures who are there. It's done. And Jesus' dream, Jesus' vision, Jesus' goal was that the same would be true on this planet. Because this planet is the place, the theater, the spot in the universe where God is going to demonstrate that he is, in fact, the king. How did the Apostle Paul put it? That when Jesus returns, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess in heaven and on the earth and beneath the earth that Jesus is Lord. Above the earth, on the earth, and beneath the earth that Jesus is is Lord to the glory of the Father. That is our dream. That is our goal. 
That is our vision. And nothing less of that is worthy of our King Jesus, and nothing less than that is worthy of you as one of his followers. That the earth be turned into the kingdom of God. There it is. That's why mission is so important, because the mission is all about seeing that happen. Are you into that? Is that what you get up in the morning thinking about? How can I turn my little piece of the earth into a place where God's will is done like it's done in heaven? How can my own heart, how can my own family, how can my business, how can my community, how can my local church, how can we be accomplishing that goal? That is what our King Jesus has called us to do. So rather than thinking of yourself as just kind of surviving in this planet, hoping that you'll make it so that when you pass away, you'll go into heaven, your life really ought to be oriented toward what's happening here. Now, let me just tell you something. I'm so old, I think about dying all the time now. Anybody else in that, in that place in life? Sort of like uh, any time, any minute now, any minute now, it's going to happen. Okay. So when that occurs to you, it's very easy to be focusing on, am I ready to die? And I want you, please, to focus on, am I ready to die? Because as you move on up in the years, you realize you're not going to live forever. It's going to come soon. And it's really important for every individual person to come to the point that they trust Jesus to make sure that they are ready to die. It's wonderful. But as that time gets shorter... Our focus needs to be even more intense upon not just what's going to happen to me, but what's happening around me on earth as it is in heaven. So, Grandma, Grandpa, I'm one of you. You still got children who are running around. And you still got grandchildren that are running around. And you've got neighbors who are also close to the point of death. And you've got friends and brothers and sisters who are that way too. And your calling is to bring the kingdom of God to earth as it is in heaven in your life. Not to back off, but to become even more intense. And I'm sure you've heard the story. I don't know whether it's true or not. It may be a fable of the poor grandmother who had had a stroke and she couldn't speak anymore and the pastor comes in to talk to her in the hospital bed and she really can't respond to him much she can't talk but he's saying all these kinds of things and the whole time she's lying there in the bed and she's doing this do you know this story it's a great one i don't know if it's true or not but it's good enough true enough she's lying there in the bed pointing like this and finally the preacher understands what she's saying and that is he wants her to go talk he wants she wants him to go talk to the woman in the bed next to her and so he does and he ministers to her and basically what that woman was saying was i'm okay okay i'm ready for this okay but she's not when you start thinking about the last things to say to your children the last words you'll say, that last letter that you're going to write that you want them to read after you pass away, turn them toward the king, turn them toward the kingdom. This is what it's all about. Because your time of service on this planet may be coming to an end very soon, but the time of service, the time of mission is not coming to an end. You're handing it off to other people. That's what's happening. And trust me, they will be listening to your last words a lot more than they listen to your early words. (laughs) Yeah? Those will be precious things that you can say to your grandkids. Precious things to say to your own children. The most important thing for you is to live for the mission that Jesus has given to us. Okay, that's people my age. But this is not just for people my age. This is for people that are raising their children now. What are you trying to do? 
I know on a day-to-day basis, it's just like, oh, am I going to make it till bedtime? I understand that. And, you know, we'll do all kinds of things to force them to make our lives a little more pleasant. And that's okay. I got it. You got to survive this thing of raising children. But the truth is, is that something ought to be on your heart and on your mind more than anything else. I'm raising children not to make me proud. I'm raising children not to make me seem successful to people or to satisfy, satisfy my guilt, satisfy my yearnings for significance. I'm raising these children for the sake of the kingdom of God. I am preparing servants for the kingdom of God. I want them to go further in making God's will happen on this planet than I have ever been able to do. And you're laying that foundation for them. That's what it's all about. And if you're someone that doesn't have children, you're just a teenager or whatever you may be, and you're thinking to yourself, what, why am I breathing the air of this planet? That's a great question. You should ask that, by the way. Are you breathing the air on this planet just because you're afraid of the alternative? Not breathing? Well, here's what's so wondrous about Jesus is that Jesus tells us, and he's so wonderful to give us this good gift, there's a reason to breathe other than being afraid of not breathing. And here it is. You can be a person who turns the world into the kingdom of God. That's worth living for. Okay, so let's get right down to reality here for a minute. Most of you are not going to go to some exotic place and do mission work. If God calls you to that, great. Go do it. It will be a great adventure. Your, your, Your great adventure, okay, to go to some exotic place. Be a lot better than watching more TV. But maybe that's not what God's called you to do. Maybe he's called you to stay right here. So start asking yourself this question, you know. Um, When I go to Walmart and I deal with the cashier, does that cashier notice anything different about me? Or am I just like everybody else that's standing in line? I don't know what your neighborhood is like, but let me tell you about mine. We are the only family that looks like me. In my whole neighborhood, it's the weirdest thing. I live in Orlando, Florida, a little gated community. You'd think everybody in there would be, you know, a a monogamous, heterosexual couple with two and a half kids and a dog, right? You would imagine that everybody in that neighborhood would be that way. They're not that way anymore. The only way you can tell the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian in my neighborhood is the Christian will wave and smile as he's hitting the garage door button trying to get in without having to connect to anybody. Everybody else is just hitting the garage door button. Is that the way your life is in your neighborhood? When a family in your neighborhood has lost a loved one, are you there? When a, when a family in your neighborhood is going through a divorce, are you there? When a family in your neighborhood has wayward teenagers in their home, are you the one that knows about this and cares enough about them that they would come to you and tell you, I don't know what to do? Or have you isolated yourself because life is all about me, and again, for the super spiritual, my nuclear family, and I'm just trying to get them all into heaven? It's an amazing thing what Jesus has done for us, that he has told us that life is not just for dying, but that life is for living, living for him on mission. And this mission is to preoccupy us every day of every life. You know, the Bible says that Jesus is the light of the world, and we all go, that's right, he is the light of the world. But do you know what the Bible also says? It says, you are the light of the world. And your next door neighbor is living in darkness. That person at the store, the grocery store, is living in darkness. And they're looking for some light. And you are it. 
So all those things at the bottom half of the Lord's Prayer that usually preoccupy us, please help me with my finances, daily bread. Please forgive me of my sins. I've done it again. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Please help me. The temptations are just mounting against me. I'm in this supernatural struggle. I just don't think I can win it. That bottom half of the Lord's Prayer, why do you want to have success in the provisions of daily life? It's so you can serve the king and his kingdom. Why do you want to be forgiveness of, for forgiveness of for your sins? It's so you can serve the king and his kingdom. Why do you want help against the forces of evil that are coming after you and against your children as well? It's so that you can serve the king and the kingdom. That's the vision. That's the dream. That's the goal. Our Father who art in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Amen and amen. So let's go for it. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we bless you and we love you that you have given to us people who are not naturally inclined even to think of you, but you've given us words that can make sense out of life and give us purpose give us vision, give us hope for having significance in a lost and dying world. Please grant to us the faith to know that you are our great emperor and that your desire above all is for your kingdom to come to this earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Christy Mansfield with Third Mill. I'm the director of donor relations, and I'm so glad to be with you all right now. Um, we've been thinking about this event for a very long time, for several months, and it's just fun to be here and be among you. And I would say Richard probably feels this way, but I know I do. I feel like I'm just one of you. So thank you for welcoming me. Um, Mrs. Z gave me her, her little scarf to wear today, so I feel like part of the family, mostly because I didn't want to be gray and black. I wanted to have some color you know. Um, but anyway, we're just really glad to be here. I'm just going to show you a, a few things by PowerPoint and one video, and then we're going to go to Richard. I have more I could talk about, and he could talk for hours probably on all that God's doing through Third Mill. It's incredible. I've, I loved hearing from the Acells, and I loved hearing uh, Rachel Brown and from Reverend Shelnut at the beginning. He said all the things we normally say about where the church is growing the fastest and what God's doing through that. But I'm gonna take you through just a couple of things here and then I'm gonna get to the fun part, the video. Let's go. So, the Atlas of Global Christianity says, if trends continue, that by 2050, we're going to have almost a billion new believers in the world, and you know where, you know where that is. Africa, um, you'll see this. Africa is almost a half a billion. Asia, a quarter, Latin America. That's where the church is growing the fastest. This is one of the things that really motivates us to do what we do. Um, what does the church need? Obviously, probably 10 million trained church leaders in the next 27 years. The more, the better, right? And who's going to do that? Well, it's going to take all of us working together to do that. Um, and who will train them, right? That's the question. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for they were like sheep without a shepherd. That's our heart. Let me see. See if I can play this. Now, this video is our origin story video. It will tell you how we got started and why we do what we do. I remember one time I was in a country and I was there to lead a big church planting conference of about 300 people or so. And I was introduced to the elder of the Christian church there. It was just a little block house that he lived in, a one-room house. We talked for a while with the translator, but eventually, after a few minutes, his daughter came out. She was nine years old, beautiful little girl, and about the age of my granddaughter, my oldest granddaughter at the time. But when she came out, she came out walking on the heels of her hands like this because her legs were twisted up under her body, just gnarled up under her body. 
And as we left, the pastor of this church looked at me and he said, we can fix her legs. And when I reached in my pocket, he said, no, 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 I don't want your money. We can have her legs fixed for free in the next town at the hospital. And I said, then what's the problem? He said, well, the Lord has told her father and me that her family is under a curse. And the only way to get the curse off of her family is for her to spend her life like this. That was her pastor saying this. That is the kind of suffering that followers of Jesus face all over the world because their pastors have never been taught the Bible. And at third millennium, we're going to change that. The vision that third millennium has is this, rather than strategically choosing this little place and that little place and this little place and that little place, instead what we want to do is create a curriculum that can be distributed everywhere so that everybody can get it in their own land, in their own language, biblical education, for the world, for free. It's very simple for us. We want to teach what the Bible teaches. We decided it's going to create what we call edutainment. It's educational and it's entertaining. Not just the words of scripture and the concepts, but theology as well. We've got to take seminary, we've got to put it in a box, and we've got to send it to them. Third Mill exists because we believe that every Christian deserves a well-trained pastor. There is a shortage of cash. If they have the resources, a lot of these pastors and church leaders still can't afford to go to seminary or to get advanced training in the Bible and theology. I saw them having to leave their homes, their children, their families, their churches, and heard what happened to a lot of those families while they were gone. And I know that through third millennium, that doesn't have to happen anymore. If we want to reach every pastor, every Christian leader around the world, our curriculum has to be available at every level of technology. So if you're in a place like Southern Sudan and all you have is paper, then we have our manuscripts. And the next level up would be audio, MP3. It would be downloadable. It would be streaming on the web. Above that, we have video streaming on the web. We have it downloadable on the web. We have it in medium definition. We have it in high definition, depending on how good your internet access is. The technology kept shrinking and shrinking and shrinking so that now we can put two years of seminary, full videos of seminary, along with books, along with exams, along with all kinds of things, on a micro SD card that's about the size of my thumbnail. Biblical education for the world for free. And the free part is a very important part of our ethic. We want to make this as easy as possible to put into as many languages as we can to reach the most people that we can. It's just amazing how God has brought a concert of people and ideas and beliefs together so that every single church leader in the world can now have sound theological and biblical teaching. So I hope that explains a little bit about what we do. We have 27 video courses and they're not your typical video. They're, they're like the history documentary, um, history channel documentaries. Uh, we have graphics, we have, um, hosts we have professors in there but they're small snippets of what they're saying we have a we have um we have it in 24 languages now and we're adding to those languages so god has done he has built this curriculum the last well probably the first 22 years of this ministry and the last few years we've just been figuring out how to get it on the ground in 10 regions of the world, and that's what we're doing now. So there's so much more we'd like to say, but Richard can tell more stories and um, give you a little more information about what we're doing. But if you wanna sign up for our newsletter, which is quarterly, we have sign-up sheets on the table out there. Feel free to take that. Feel free also to take a book. Um, this was a book that was written in honor of Richard um, as an academic um, seminary professor. 
But there are some really great chapters in here, and one of it is um, our former director, um, executive director is Michael Briggs, and he has a whole chapter just on Third Mill. Uh, but it, when you read this, especially um, some of the, the later chapters, the one by Steve Brown is amazing, and the one by Monica Taffinger, a former uh, student of his, is also really amazing. Um, it gives you some of the DNA of who Third Mill is, what our curriculum is like. It's, it's amazing, reformed theology, but we don't tell anyone that around the world, and they are using it like crazy. So, Richard, we'll okay. let you. Great. Hey, everybody. Are you ready to go home? <laughs> I'm kind of torn. I'm kind of torn as to what to do. I'm looking to you for some guidance here. Go, go. go where, though? <laughs> um, how long are we scheduled to go? As long as you like. <laughs> he said, as long as you like. Are you happy now? <laughs> or how about 30 minutes? Okay. Um, the, this ministry is called Third Millennium Ministries. I said this to the pastors over here the other night, but I would like for you, like, here's a nice quiz. Why do you think we're called Third Millennium? We are in the third Christian millennium. That's right. Does everybody understand that? Zero to 1,000, first Christian millennium, 1,001 to 2,000, second, and now we're in, what year is this? 2022. We started in 1998, so we've been around now for 25, almost 26 years, and um, the vision of Third Millennium Ministries is biblical education for the world for free. Okay, so... Let me see if I can unpack that for you, and I'll try then to go to the Bible, okay? Biblical education, what we do is we, cre we have created and are now producing and distributing in 24 different languages around the world, um, seminary-level education. It'd be the kind of thing I taught in seminary for uh, 24 years or so, okay? So I kind of know what goes on in seminary. But what we do is we do we fill in a particular need out there in the mission field. And here's the need. Uh, teaching is wonderful to have for lay people who are learning things like stop beating your wife. Thank you very much. Believe it or not, Christian people have to be taught that, okay? and how to pray, how to do basic discipleship. And there are also lots of ministries that do sort of what we might call advanced discipleship, okay? Uh, share your faith, those kinds of things. And those are wonderful, magnificent, spectacular ministries. Some of those you saw earlier in, earlier in the day, okay? Just phenomenal. But as we started looking at the, the need of the church, uh, the Lord led us toward this idea, that, the, the basic idea, and that is, look, you know your pastor and how much education he's had, yeah? Yes? Okay. Imagine, please go with me on this with a few nods, okay? <laughs> Imagine, now you know how much, how much he's messed up your life along the way. Even though he's had all this Bible teaching and all this seminary education, he's really messed up your life. Say amen, somebody? Amen. Good. Okay. Now, if that's true, imagine what he would have done to you if he had had less than one hour of teaching in the Bible. The experts will tell you that over 90% of pastors running churches today in the world have had less than one hour of training in the Bible. So just imagine what he would have done to you, how he would have abused you, how he would have misused you and misled you sincerely often although with him i'm not so sure um, but sincerely not knowing any better because nobody had ever brought him up to the level of bible and christian teaching that you would expect your pastor to have so we sort of sat back and said okay why shouldn't it be true that the whole world has pastors who know the bible as well as your pastors do does that make sense to you? 
okay? And you just go, well, why not? I mean, after all, um, the church in the United States of America is shrinking so fast, you can, you can, it would take your breath away if you knew the numbers. You saw the list of where the church is growing the fastest. I'll go back to that in just a moment. But did you notice who's not on that, on that slide? North America. We're at the bottom of the list. We are behind Western Europe. We are behind Oceania. Who even, who even knows where Oceania is? Okay. Church is growing faster there than it is here. We're shrinking as fast as we possibly can. The number one spot on the earth where the church is growing is Africa. And the numbers that they gave you earlier in the day are right on. Now, by 2050, the estimate is that if the Holy Spirit continues to do what he has been doing, now, Holy Spirit is the kind of person of the Trinity that tends to do things that are unpredictable, but at the same time, if he continues to do what he has been doing, there will be over a billion professing Christians in Africa. Now, we don't know their hearts. Is every brand of cornflakes you could name, okay, and there are lots of them, okay, but a billion professing Christians. And if you have in Africa, and we have got to ensure that they have leaders who know the Bible, that means as valuable as it is to have a small group here and a small group there and a small group there, it's extremely valuable, and we work with organizations. In fact, you, did you hear our name mentioned? Okay, third millennium. Okay, we work with missionaries all over the world because this is real important for you to understand that this is not Richard Pratt's worldwide teaching ministry. Like, we need another one of those? Does anybody think we need anybody's worldwide teaching ministry ever again? Please, no, okay? So we have over 400 professors who appear in our lessons from all over the world because we believe that teachers of the world should be teaching the whole world. One of the big problems that you have with theological students in this country is most of their teachers are Americans. So have they ever suffered persecution? Hello? No. Have, are, they, are, they, are they therefore ready to engage students in facing the challenges that are right around the corner for us here in this country? Somebody please say no. No. Okay. Okay, so we bring teachers from places like if you watched one of our videos, you would see somebody from Africa, China, Russia, Latin America, Middle East, and a couple of Americans here and there, um, all on the same lesson. Do you follow what I'm saying? A lot like a History Channel documentary where they had the expert interviews, because you don't, you don't put professors on camera very long. <laughs> Can you figure out why? Because there's nothing more boring than a professor except the professor on video. <laughs> except the professor on video translated into another language. Okay? For that, you know, they just want to jump off a bridge. We don't want people jumping off the bridge. So we'll put them on for about a minute and a half. Our, our, our curriculum is vetted and written by qualified people, not just me, qualified people from around the world. And we've gone through all these efforts to make sure that we have something that's of such a quality that the body of Christ will want to use it. That's our, what we mean when we say biblical education. If you were going to a seminary here in this country, it would be equal to an M, a two-year MA program. Say amen, somebody. Okay, great. But the average educational level of a pastor in the world today is seventh grade. So somebody had to make something that could be used at that MA level, but also for somebody that is low literacy at the same time, yeah? Well, guess what the answer to that is? Not a book, but... Video, graphic-driven video, images. Okay, do you follow what I'm saying to you? So we edutain them to death. Because we want them to know the truth. That's what we mean by biblical education. Biblical education, remember what the second tagline is? For, for the world. I know you know it, Christy. <laughs> That's pretty good, though. Okay. Biblical education, seminary-level education. By the way, you could understand it. It's not that big of a deal. What they teach in seminary is not that complicated. Trust me. It's not like going to a medical school or something, okay? It's for a bunch of guys that had business degrees to come and 
be your preacher, okay? So how, how hard can it be? <laughs> I'm just encouraging them to look at it because you can benefit from it, okay? All right, so biblical education for the world. Somebody had to say it because nobody was 25 years ago. The whole world. Do you remember what Jesus told us to do to the whole world? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then what's next? Teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. There you go. I'm not going to give away another sermon element here because I've got to use that later today. But that's, but that's very important to us. And how much of the world? All of it. The woman that started Third Mill, or talked me into working with her to start it, you have to sort of imagine this person. Uh, she was the matriarch of one of the largest cotton farms in Mississippi. Okay? And she was either going to continue in her tennis career or she was going to do something meaningful in life okay so she's sitting in reformed theological seminary she was a student in two different programs and she like put to shame all the men that's for sure okay it's like she's just zipping through all this you know nine thousand kids and forty four thousand grandchildren you know and picking the cotton okay that's what they were doing okay and so she was she um, was sitting in the library one day you need this is just to let you know the heart of what we are okay because you hear seminary and most of us go what why would you ever want to impose a cemetery in another <laughs> on another group of people so this is what happened to her she was sitting there minding her own business an african student came and said, can I see that magazine? It was a Time magazine. So she just picked it up and handed it to him. He sat down at the other end of the table, and he started shouting, that's my son, as he's looking at the front cover. That's my son. That's my son. And so she jumped up to see what in the world was going on and ran around, took the magazine from him, and it was a picture on the front cover of a pile of dead African children who had been slaughtered in their village square, and one or two of the faces were showing, and this student was convinced seminary student was convinced it was his son whom he had not seen for two years. Why? He was a seminary in the United States, and you certainly don't bring their families. Why not? The cost is one. Why wouldn't you bring their families? Wouldn't that be a nice thing to do? They won't go back. 92% don't go back anyway for more than five years. You just need to know that. So she calls me up, and they called the Red Cross back in those days, 1997. You couldn't just use your mobile phone to call Africa, okay? So they called the Red Cross. They found out a couple of weeks later it was his son. He had been dead for more than a week. He didn't even know. And there his picture was on Time magazine. And so she calls me on the phone. I'm already living in Orlando, but I had taught in Jackson, Mississippi, and our families were friends and, you know, all that kind of thing. So she calls me, and she knew that I was interested in trying to teach around different parts of the world, and I was work my wife and I were working hard at doing that. And she just said, Rich, we can't do this anymore. And I said, what? She said, bring international students here. We just can't. we got to stop it. Well, what do you want to do about it, Janie? She says, I want to put seminary in a box and send it to them. And so in this conversation, I said, well, where do you want to send it? And she said, everywhere. Well, how many do you want to reach? All of them. Well, that's a pretty big vision. And I'm listening to her. And then the faithful words she said to me were these. She said, if I can get the money, can you get the box? Now, how do you, how do you respond to the matriarch of a plantation? What do you say? Yes, ma'am, I can get the box. I can get the box. <clears throat> and that's how we began. That's what Third Mill is about. This is not because I didn't have a job. I had the easiest job in the world being a seminary professor. Okay? It didn't mean I didn't have security. We gave all that up to do this. Do you follow what I'm saying? And it's, it's just a wonderful thing where we have now, we, we, I, can, I promise you this is not a missionary story. It's not evangelistically speaking. I'll say it again. It's not evangelistically speaking, okay? We can verify what I'm about to tell you. Um, we are in over 160 countries, 
in 22, being used in 22 languages. We're on television, we're on radio, we're being used in schools, Bible schools in these countries, we're being used in local churches that are training their own pastors, those sorts of things, which is the main way in which this happens around the world. Uh, we have minist independent ministries that will go in, sort of swoop in and do short conferences, and then they use our stuff in between those conferences. Like if I talk to the first guy that was here today, what's his name? Yeah, if I, if I talk to him, and I'm going to now, now that I've seen his picture, okay, if, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he does use third mail, at least some, but, you know, what he's doing basically is trying to bring, like, pastors in to teach, right? Do you follow what I'm saying? From here and other places in the world, bring them in for a week or two. That's great, fantastic. You need that so badly I can hardly stand it, okay? And I'm glad to say there are lots and lots of ministries that do that. But, the, but most of those guys are not going to move there, right? Okay, so what do you do in between these week-long conferences that I'm sure your pastor's going to in just a couple of months? Now that you're inspired. <laughs> Somalia sounds good to me. Let's go together, okay? So what do you do after the, after the visiting missionary's gone? See, that's the problem. You with me on this? And the answer is third mill. So we are in Dubai. We saw some work in Dubai. We are, to my knowledge, yes, we are actually. We're in Somalia using Arabic, um, but not Somalian because that's a whole other language. And that you know what that means, don't you? If you do a new language, what's that mean? Yes, yeah, it's, it's called money. Okay, and and I'm not here to ask you for money. Is what I'm trying to communicate here, um, but. Okay, so when Jesus sent his disciples out, what did, how, how far did he want them to go? Everywhere. How many people did he want them to reach? All of them, okay? That's exactly what Miss Cheney said to me that day. But if you read the New Testament, the key for reaching the world is those local pastors that are raised up who are serving people in their own culture, in their own language, and we are seeking to equip them. So it's biblical education. What's the second tagline? For the world. Okay, so for example, we're broadcast by television twice a week into Mecca, right into Muhammad's living room. Hallelujah. Allahu Akbar is exactly right. Okay? Okay, right into his living room. We're broadcast 24 hours. I you know this is going to be hard to believe. I promise no evangelisticity here. We are broadcast 24 hours a day for the last year, the last 12 years, broadcast 24 hours a day, seven days a week in Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world, 250 million people in this country, on television, uh, in English, Chinese, and then Bahasa, Indonesia, and then they go to the next lesson, English, Chinese, Bahasa, Indonesia. Next lesson, English, okay, through our whole two-year curriculum, and then when they get to the end of it, guess what they do? They start over. It's just running, 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 running. I won't even tell you the numbers of people that, um, that the television companies that send us out, that transmit us, I won't tell you the numbers they give because I think their numbers are evangelistic, okay? But it's huge. It would blow your mind if a tenth of what they tell us is true. It would absolutely, like, your head would explode. Now, do you think I did that? I'm to, you know what I, you, didn't, you know what, <laughs> you don't know who I am. I'm an Old Testament professor. Is there anything more irrelevant than that? Anything nerdier than that? You follow what I'm saying? Okay, well, the Lord has really blessed. This is, there, I think the reason that I've been called to this is to demonstrate that this is not me doing it. It's not because I've got some kind of talent for this. If this is to demonstrate that God can take some nerd that enjoyed learning cuneiform and Babylonian, okay? If Jesus would just leave me alone, I'd still be in some closet somewhere covered in spider webs trying to learn, read another tablet of Babylonian, okay? Okay, but he doesn't leave me alone. That's the problem. So biblical education for the world. Do you remember the last tagline? for free. 
You know that Bible verse, freely you receive, so charge them as much as possible? You remember that one? You saw enough today to see what kinds of people there are out there who need this. Do you think they have any money for this? No. Okay, so we're all over Cuba, for example. We're all over Latin America. We're all over Africa. We're all over Asia. It's just crazy unbelievable. And this is a wonderful, wonderful good thing. And we give it away to them for free. We even pay for those little thumb drives we're talking about. Okay? We even make sure that they are paid for. And, um, of course, it's not free to make. I have to say that. It's, ex you know, it's, ex it's expensive to make. But we're doing it by God's grace and by the kindness of God's people. And wonderful, wonderful things are resulting from it. I can tell you without one moment of hesitation that today we have served and are serving 1.768 million students. That's a good number if you didn't know. Okay? 1.768 students. And that's just a, that's not television. We don't even count that, remember? That's like 23 million. I didn't tell you that. But, okay, forget the 23 million. Just think 1.7680. We're on our way, however, to reaching 4 million. 4 million. That's the goal for the next five years. Now imagine this. Imagine you're teaching 4 million church leaders, and every one of those 4 million church leaders in a lifetime, let's say, will, reach, will touch the life of 100 people. That's a pretty reasonable estimate there. Just touch them. And so if we, with your help and your prayers, are able to reach those four million in the next five years, which really is just the beginning, but nevertheless, that's a good beginning. Um, if they all reach a hundred people, how many people would you be impacting? 400 million. That's more than the number of people in this country. Do you hear what I'm saying? But the need is right now for at least um, nine million pastors to be trained like tomorrow. And did you see what happens when they're not? That little story of that little girl? Uh, that's the kind of story you can... Here's a good Southernism. You'll understand it. That's the kind of story that you saw in the video. That's one that I can tell you in mixed company. It's one of the nicer stories of things that I've seen and others have seen. Because it's a nightmare out there. It's a nightmare among people who claim the name of Jesus. It's an absolute nightmare what pastors without knowing the Bible, who don't know the Bible, will do to their people. It's just unbelievable. And we're not going to let that be true anymore. Amen? That's, I mean, that's what we've got to do. We've got to just turn that around. It's easy. It's easy to do. We've been working at it for 25 years. We're just beginning to actually do the push out. We're, we've been pushing, but we're just beginning. And 1.7 million for us is just like, okay, now we've got the small Bible study group. Now what's next? Yes, ma'am, we're done. I'm done. Yes. Yes. That's exactly what we do. That's exactly what we do. We have over 400, I think now the number is 428, but I didn't look before I came here today. We have over 400 organizations around the world that have official contractual partnerships with us. Okay, including your own mission board, by the way. And my, I'm in the PCA, my mission board. Um, because, you remember the old Ghostbusters song? Okay, so when you hear strange things in the neighborhood, who are you gonna call? Ghostbusters, right? Say yes, tell me you know that, okay. 
All right, so if you want a pastor trained in French, who are you going to call? Third mill. Russian? Mandarin Chinese? If you're a Latino in this country, and they're all over this area, by the way, who have churches, and they've never been taught the Bible, and they may speak English well enough to mow your yard, but they don't know English well enough to go to a school. Okay, so they're right here. I mean, they're right here. So when you hear a need for Spanish for pastors, who are you going to call? Arabic, who are you going to call? Urdu and Pakistan, which is one of your denomination's historical fields, who are you going to call? See, the answer is, well, I wish there were somebody else to call. I would not have done this if there had been somebody else to call. And so, yes, we work with these partners all over the world. And it's the, the hunger for this is just phenomenal. And, the, and organizations will often have tried to do it themselves, okay, for years and years and years. And then when they finally find us or we find them somehow, uh, then they go, well, this is it. It's not that we're going to stop doing our thing and let Third Mill do it. Mm -mm -mm -mm. It's always in partnership. Yes, ma'am. 24 in process, 22 active. Yeah, we'll be 32 in four years. And then what, like, what does it cost third mil to add? <laughs> it's going to sound big. Is that all right? To go from zero to full video, like you could broadcast on TV if you wanted to, okay, um, it's right at $400,000. Now, that's, that's a lot of money to me. You with me? Is that okay? That's a lot of money to me. Any, is that little? Is that pocket change to anybody in this room? I want to know who you are. <laughs> okay, preacher, is that pocket change to anybody in this church? Okay, so, but what you're making is something that will be used by hundreds of thousands of people for years and years and years. Okay, that's, that's the, does that help? Does that give you this kind of a picture? But let's just say this, you're, you're interested in Afghanistan, right? Um, one of the prominent business languages in Afghanistan is Urdu. So we had a church come to us and say, will you do Pashto? And we said, well, it's going to be hard to find the right people because you understand they may be able to translate for you on the street, but translating Christian theology, okay, is, is a little more technical, right? Okay, so, I, so we researched it out and we found out how many Urdu speakers there are in Afghanistan, and this was before the what do we call it? Disaster. Okay, there, that's a nice neutral word. Um, and so we were concentrating on Urdu and seeing, and now, but here's, here's an interesting thing. As we're talking to the Urdu people in Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, I just assumed that Pakistanis Christians were missionizing Afghanistan. The answer is no way. So see, we're going to be inspiring those Pakistanis to get busy because Afghanistan is their mission field, to be sure. And so it will be in Pashto one day when there's a sufficient number. But they can take our stuff as, I'll, well, I'll give you another example. Um, in Peru, okay, we're in Spanish, we're in Peru, but the Chechuans up in the mountains of Peru don't speak Spanish. But there are a lot of people that do both, especially the church leaders. And so what they do is they, they put it into Chechuan. They just do it themselves apart from us. So it's cheaper when you do those kinds of things, and it's also cheaper if you just want it in a book because all, everything's scripted, so it's a book. Okay? In fact, they're published as books all around the world. But the video is the most effective. But in, for example, Tanzania, they have the script or the book, and then they, because they're low literacy, they also have the audio, and the audio will go on their phone. So they're listening to it and what, looking at the page, which is now an illustrated page, and so they're able to get it that way because they've got audio and the book. So it's truly a multimedia experience and, you know, all andragogically adult learning sound and all that stuff. <laughs> okay, if, if you're interested in that kind of thing. That's a great question. So it's expensive. It is. But the impact is phenomenal. I mean, wouldn't it be grand to be ready that if the Lord sends um, a great outpouring of Holy Spirit to Afghanistan, wouldn't it be grand to be ready 
to train the leaders of those little village churches, all of them, all of them, not just one or two. Send them over here and they don't go back, or send them to Germany and they won't go back, but all of them, all of them, all of them. Yes, sir. Since, since you told us that we're the most heathen country in the world, yes, have you translated it into English? <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant. That's brilliant. I will say this, the, the answer is yes, it starts in English, okay? Most, except for the interviews, the interviews that come from other countries, they start in whatever language they speak, okay? And it's translated into English. Um, but yeah, everything just starts in English, okay? Um, it's, but here's, here is the reality that we face in our country, and especially in the southern states, you can understand what I'm about to say. Um, and I'm from Virginia, remember, I'm one of us, okay? Um, you'd be shocked to know how few pastors, operating, functioning pastors in this country today do not have any, much of any training in the Bible at all. The most they get is what you see on Christian television. You ever watch Christian television? It's a nightmare, okay? And so we are focusing, yes, primarily, however, on ethnic communities, okay, minority communities in the United States. Can anybody guess what the fastest growing demographic of evangelicals is in this country? It's not people that look like you and talk like you. Yes, yeah, Latinos, Spanish-speaking immigrants from Latin America. Fast, I mean, it's unbelievable, the numbers. Our churches are shrinking. They are growing. But their pastors have no opportunity to learn the Bible. I, I've been told that in the greater Charlotte area, there are at least 100,000 such people. Did you hear what I said? 100,000. They're next-door neighbors. They're, they are working in your yard. They're working in the kitchen of the Mexican restaurant that you will go to after this today. You follow what I'm saying? And they're pastors. So start reaching out to those people. We're ready to go in Spanish. We can do it like that. You can do it like that. And you don't even have to know Spanish to do it. Yes, ma'am. Say again. We have French, yes, especially for East, for West Africa. We don't like the French, <laughs> right? I mean, who cares about the French? Like whatever. <laughs> but those West Africans, we care about them. So yes, we're in, we're in Cameroon, Togo, all those kinds of places over there. It's just phenomenal. The Southern Baptist mission in um, West Africa, French speak Francophone Africa. Um, the head of it in Africa uh, just came to our guy just like three or four months ago and said, can you handle, uh, we have 50,000 pastors. Can you, can, can, can you handle 50,000? And the answer is, well, yeah, of course. That's easy. Had a Methodist seminary in Lagos, Nigeria. Call me directly. I don't know how they got me, but they got me on the phone. He said, I'm such and such from such and such seminary in Lagos. We have like a thousand students. We want to go. This is Methodist. We want to go to 10,000. I said, We can do that. Not a problem. You can do it in two years. You can have 10,000. It won't be a problem. Why not? That's what I want to say. Why not? And by the way, if you think this is kind of weird and like contrary to the New Testament, please keep in mind what our Lord Jesus did. He only had 12 disciples, right? And so you might think, well, it'd be better just to get five or six guys together and do it in five, units of five. But why, and the Apostle Paul liked to travel, so he went to places, okay? And he told the Thessalonians, I wish I could come see you. I really can't do that, so here's my mediated curriculum, multimedia, my letter to you. You follow what I'm saying? So how did the church grow and spread? It was through mediated teaching. See, yeah, I got it. Not by direct one-on-one -on -one teaching. As important as that is, as valuable as it is, we want the whole world, and to do that, we've got to find other ways to do it. Yes, ma'am.
Right. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> the answer, well, her question is, I think, um, are you reaching low literacy people or not illiterate? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, it is, it is if you use the video, yes, but if you use the scripts, as, if you use the manuscript, it's not the books, it's not, okay? So basically what we do is we are, you can't, you can't take a 30-year-old man and tell him, you need to learn to read before you can uh, read well, before you can start preaching, right? So we reach them where they are, and by the way, your children are illiterate, Remember, I taught in the seminary. They walked in the seminary, and you know you, they had to go buy a three hundred dollar, four hundred page book. They've never looked at a four hundred page book, much less read one. Amen, amen to that. I mean, remember the first big book you got at seminary? You probably didn't even read it. It's still probably still holding up a shelf in your office. You didn't even read it ever. Okay, so we are reaching. We are now reaching. <laughs> so we're oriented toward Gen Z. Because Gen Z is the leaders, is the, is the coming leaders of the church. Okay, so everything is in small bites. It's all very manipulable and that kind of thing. And um, they don't want to read either. Now, do we want to get them to the point that they will read? Yes. Okay, so what we do is ramp them in and they stack some reading. We stack the reading on it. So we're used, for example, we've got eight different accredited seminaries and universities that have programs using Third Mill. Okay, that kind of thing. And of course, you have to have reading for that. But in um, Tanzania, no way. Because like mentioning the Pentecostal holiness, um, we have um, all kinds of Pentecostal bishops love us, okay? The, I wish we had the, we don't have that news clip from South Sudan, do we? This is wonderful news clip um, that I just, we just got off the, out of the blue, okay? Somebody just sent it to us. And it was national news, like NBC, South Sudan. That sounds exciting, doesn't it? NBC, South Sudan, okay? And they did a national commercial on Third Mill. And it was the Anglican bishops who have approved this and ordained this for their people and our guy in South Sudan. And they're like talking about how South, how South Sudan is going to be changed by Third Mill. That's magnificent. I'll give you one other example. I love this. We have been identified as in India by one of the number one anti-missionary groups um, because, I don't know if you know this, but missionaries are being thrown out of India. Say, yes, I knew, uh, tell me you knew that. Because now the official religion of India is Hindu, Hinduism. It's the official religion. They are a, their Hindu nationalism is what it's all about now in India. So um, this group, this anti-missionary Hindu nationalism group has identified third millennium ministries, put our pictures up and all kinds of things, like in the FBI, most wanted kinds of pictures, put our pictures up on Twitter and on the website and so on and so all social media, uh, identifying us as the number one threat to Hindu nationalism in India. Hallelujah. <laughs> We're waiting for the day when our offices are attacked. We're praying for that day. Because when that happens, we will know we have begun to do something. Does that make sense to you? And um, piping this stuff into Mecca is phenomenal. Um, we are in Farsi, which is the language of Iran. We'll be in, we, are all, we are already in there a little bit through Dubai. But we will be there either before the war or after the war. Does that make sense? before Israel strikes them or after it. Uh, and Christianity is growing there by leaps and bounds, but the only thing they have educationally is Christian television from the United States by satellite. And it's a nightmare what they're learning. But we're going to tell them the truth. Here's my selfish reason for third mill. Oh, excuse me. Oh, like Trinity Broadcast Network, things like that, where they're doing all the faith healers, you know, give me, your, give me some money and um, your husband will be young and virile again. 
those kinds of TVs, okay? <laughs> Try it. Um, but uh, you understand what I'm saying? Um, the ones, you know, the miracle workers, those Joel Osteen and worse, okay? Um, yeah, that's what they see on TV, and so they assume that's Christianity, and so they imitate it where they are. And they do crazy things like say this family that I showed you on, that we showed you on the video is under a curse. The only way to get the curse off is for this little girl to die like this. Does that make sense? This is everywhere. I mean, I didn't even tell you, but the next place I went on that very day was to a brick factory, and the Christian parents were enslaving their children, four and five year olds in a deep dark pit that I looked into where they were scraping up mud and packing them into molds for the bricks, four and five year olds, while the men and the women of the village, a squatter village on this brick factory property, were uh, singing hymns together. You got it? Okay, that kind of ignorance is very destructive to the body of Christ. And we've got to reverse those kinds of things. And the only way to do that is to equip their leaders because the leaders just stand there going, well, of course, that's what you do. That's how it works in India. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, they're in, like, that's a flash drive with a little, with a little micro SD card inside of it, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have some 45,000 subscribers on YouTube now. But YouTube is restricted in a lot of countries, like China, for example. You, they can't watch YouTube. So um, the main way we are spread around in China is with these micro SD cards. They duplicate them. All you've got to have is one, make it in. Okay, and there's so, so little metal in them, they can't be detected by even at the airports. So you get one in and then they duplicate it like crazy. Yeah. Yes? That's right. And they don't even know any better. That's what's amazing about it. I mean, brothers and sisters, let's just tell the truth. Can I tell the truth for a moment? Okay. No, I've been, I've been avoiding these kinds of things. You know, we look at these people, like in Haiti, for example, and we say, how could you possibly mix voodooism with Christianity? And that happens all over the world, okay? You're mixing the, the culture with the Christianity, right? And we're trying to know, do the Bible, do the Bible, do the Bible, right? And we can't figure out why in the world would they do this over there. It's so obviously wrong. Yeah? You with me? Okay. So obviously wrong. Well, we do something very similar, only rather than it being voodoo, it's the golden arches. Try to do a step of favor. What does that mean? Can you explain to them what that means? That's right. You know what I mean by golden arches, yes? McDonald's, okay? Capitalism. Okay, that it would be okay for you to just hoard up money for yourself and ignore the fact that the vast majority of Christians in the world have pastors that do not know anything about the Bible rather than that breaking your heart and saying that somebody's got to fix this. You hear what I'm saying? Or that they're poor and that they're starving to death or that they're being thrown into jail and we don't even know their names to pray for them, don't even know that they're there to help them and that we're afraid to help them because somebody might actually, can you imagine this, die for Jesus, one of us? Am I getting too much? Is this too much? That we were so afraid of being inconvenienced for being a Christian that we are piping down now and afraid. I mean, brother, on that campus of yours, way to go. Okay, but it's hard, isn't it? Because you never know who you're going to offend. 
And, and if you offend the wrong person, you're going to be thrown off campus. Say amen, please, to them, okay? So it's sort of like, okay, I'll put on my soft shoes, and I'll be real careful here. But every once in a while, you just can't be careful anymore. Well, welcome to the United States of America. This is, where you're, this is what your children are going to be facing, that kind of hardship. Okay, so we, we do this syncretism too, just in a way that's acceptable to us. Does that make sense? Well, in many respects... It's just common sense that, you know, if your child gets sick, you'll pray to Jesus. Okay, great. I'm a Christian. I'll pray to Jesus. If that doesn't work, I'm going next door. Do you follow me? That's Haiti. Okay, that's China. That's India. That's all of Africa. I mean, I love Jesus. But I want my baby to live, <laughs> so I'm going next door too. Thank you. For, I'm going to cover my bets, okay? And um, I don't know. If, I'm sure you know how to play roulette. Adam, do you play roulette? Been, when's the last time you were in Vegas, brother? <laughs> what you don't do, unless you're crazy on a roulette table, is put all your chips on one number, okay? What you do is, you know what you call it when you spread your chips out? Well, you cover your bet. Just tell me you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I mean, act like you know it. Golly, what, a pure, what a pure church you have. <sighs> let's, take, let's take a mission trip to Vegas, okay? And we can use the roulette table as a great example of this because when you, put your, when you put all of your chips, I mean, everything you've got on one number, and they spin that thing around, that is a great picture of what your commitment to Jesus is, okay? I mean, you have put everything on him. Every hope in this world and in the world to come, it's all on him, right? I mean, that's it. That's who we are. Jesus is Lord and no other. And we're watching that thing spin around called your life and <laughs> the marble's bouncing around and you're sort of waiting and, you know, you're looking at it. But it's so easy in that kind of life to compromise in ways that are acceptable in our culture. And that's the danger that brothers and sisters around the world face. They compromise too, but they do it in ways that are acceptable in their worlds. Sort of common sense. Yes, ma'am. Please. There's a man named Mark Ballard, and he had a real burden for setting up a school seminary in Vermont because all of the pastors were coming south to be trained. Uh-huh, and don't go, and don't go back. Would you go back to Vermont? <laughs> the same thing in Canada. We bring Canadians down here, and they've stopped doing it now because they don't go back. The youth groups are bigger down here, which is usually their first job. Yeah, and it's cold. It's so cold. Exactly. I mean, that's true. Well, imagine if you bring them from... Haiti here, are they going to go, are most of them going to go back? No. In fact, at one point, the estimate was that 92% of international theological students don't go back home for more than five years. They usually come here and have an anchor baby, so they can come back. Do you follow what I'm saying? But in, 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 with integrity, they go back. Uh, this is one, of, and, but they don't stay long. This is one of the great things about third mail. I, should I share this? Um, right now in Ukraine, third mill is kind of hot in Ukraine, okay? And we're hot in Russia too. You understand what I mean by hot? I don't mean lots of people use us, okay? Let's say it that way. And um, every morning at third mill, we have morning prayers at nine o'clock. You're welcome to come join us if you want to. It's not very long, but we do them every, every business day morning, morning prayers. And they're on Zoom. So on the Zoom call, you will see Ukrainians and Russians on the same call. Okay, now our Russian staff, we have lots of people, but the staff, they're like, you know, the ones you pay money to, the staff, um, they are also American citizens because they lived in the States for a while. They went back there to take care of her mother, her, their ni her 92 year old mother. And when the war broke out, they are only 20 miles from Moldova. They could walk to the border and with their little blue American passport, they could go, they would be welcomed in by American soldiers, in fact and protected and brought home, brought here, okay? But they voluntarily, 
out of commitment to the Lord, honor your father and your mother, are staying in south of Odessa, and they are woke, awakened every night with sirens going off of missiles flying through. The, who did I show the picture to? Yeah, the, the, the blooms. <laughs> got this wonderful picture uh, where they were having a prayer meeting in an apartment, our people, and there was this big noise, and a, a Russian missile had come through the ceiling and had landed into the kitchen sink of this apartment right next to where they were praying. It did not explode, but I got a photograph of the, of the Russian missile, okay? And the hole that came through the ceiling it was fantastic. This is what our people do. This is the kind of sacrificing they do. The Russian man on the other side of the border is refusing to join the army. He is, he is he's going to face five to ten years in a Siberian prison, and he knows it. But he and his wife, little children, have decided... We're not doing this. You're not going to go. And so there it is. So now he's just waiting for the police to remember that he's not gone. And they'll take him off to Siberia for five to ten years. All right. Hallelujah. Those are the kinds of people you've got representing you in those countries through Third Mill. That's what I'm trying to communicate to you. What, I mean, just integrity and honor and humility and devotion to the cause and they're doing it all so that the pastors of russia and the pastors of ukraine in these two cases can know the gospel can know bible teaching and lead their people in the ways of righteousness and isn't that what it's all about okay so thank you very much i'm always happy to, i could talk for days about this but thank you god bless you i've loved being with you do, do you want to close in prayer okay and we're going to now close in prayer you. Thank you. I don't need that. You don't need that? Okay. Well, I think the, the session needs to talk with you anyway after hearing what he's had to say, but uh, we'll take that up at a different time. Uh, thanks to our guests uh, from Third Mill, Richard and, and Christy, and thanks Josh and Ashley. Blessing. Uh, Thanks to the committee, to uh, Rhonda Hunter, Janice Cunningham, Nikki Bloom, Cindy Long, and Ken Sapone, and especially thanks to uh, Sarah Hill. All of this graphics and the printing and the bulletin and all that was Sarah put all that together. She even put the subtitles in on Luke's video for us because she was, so that was awesome. Uh, don't forget to take one of Richard's books. If, uh, if, if, if there, I have plenty more if there's some out there right now. Don't forget to turn your clocks back. Please join us for worship tomorrow. And now let's uh, close in prayer. Father, our hearts have been refreshed by the testimony of your saving grace working through our missionary brothers and sisters. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of sharing the gospel of salvation and the manifold blessings in your kingdom for all who place their faith in Jesus. It is our prayer that grace would extend more and more so more people would be able to bring you glory, Father, and be in your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, amen.